it's okay to point out what's wrong, but if you don't tell what's right, it's just kind of half the story. But they gave the truth and explained why these things were wrong. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, they talked a lot about, and they used the term new age, new age. But the new age isn't new. It's not new at all. It's been the same from the very beginning. Satan was a liar from the very beginning. And uh, the stuff he's, you know, pushing on people today is the same stuff he pushed on them in the garden. It's really no different, maybe a little different, has a little different dressing to it. But it's really the same. And it's interesting to me that as you read your Bible, after like the book of Hebrews and James, the, the books that are closest, or the letters that are closest to the Revelation, warn us, talk about apostasy and false teachers and false prophets that would come in the last day. Uh, we are living in the last days. I, I, I fully believe that. I'm not, I don't put a time on anything, but I believe just the way things are going in the world. You know, I, this, this, this thing that happened, this earthquake, I mean, are, are people so blind? Don't they understand that God is trying, every time something like this happens, God is trying to get someone's attention. He's trying to get someone's attention. What's happening, it says, it's, it's the beginning, Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. These are minor things. Even Hurricane Katrina in that. Now we've got this hurricane coming up the East Coast. You know, as much damage as that did, there, there's really minor things. And the things going on in the, in the Middle East, uh, they call it the Arab Spring, with all these revolts going on in Libya and Egypt and uh, Syria. And all these, all these regimes are falling and toppling, and they're being replaced by what's going to be Islamic fundamentalist governments. They might not seem that way now. You know, whenever this thing started in Libya, uh, they talked about trying to get rid of, you know, this Gaddafi guy. And, uh, but nobody talked about what was going to replace him. These, these rebels that they've been helping, they don't know, they never knew where they were, you know. <laughs> and and it probably, they know that there's Al-Qaeda mixed in there. So, I mean, this is just, things are happening where the, the, the world is, is, the lines are being drawn in the world. The lines are being drawn in our nation, in our society, in our culture. And, uh, and, and most of the lines, many of, many of the divisions is, is over the nation of Israel. That's the, the, the turning point. That's really the, uh, the thing. Anyway, that's, I'm not getting into all that, but I believe that we're living in those times that, that Peter and Jude and uh, Paul in some of his epistles spoke about, end times. And uh, all this false stuff, all this, all this false teaching that has crept in to the body of Christ in different places, in different ways, has the purpose of distracting and destroying Christians' testimony. I said before, uh, Sunday morning, I said, Satan, for the unbeliever, Satan does everything he can to keep him from hearing the gospel. He'll do everything he can to keep the unbeliever from hearing a, the, a clear presentation of the gospel. For believers, he does everything he can to nullify our testimony. He has everything to distract us, to, to lie to us, to help make us compromise, and we talked about that. So it's important that we understand, and those, those videos we were looking at, we didn't just watch them just to kind of, you know, look at a neat video, but it was to instruct us and to teach us and to warn us. You know, we don't have to be afraid, but we have to be aware. And that's what's the most important thing. We need to be aware of what's going on. So, tonight, I wanted to uh, begin just a couple weeks of reading this little letter that Peter wrote. <coughs> Second Peter. Uh, he wrote it to the church. If you have a Bible, some Bibles might call this a Catholic epistle. It doesn't mean it belongs to the Catholic Church. It means it's universal. It's written to the entire church. And in this letter, he warns us. But before he warns us, he gives us a foundation on which we can stand. See, we don't have to be afraid of the lies of the devil if we got the truth right. If we got things right with God, if we're, if, we're, if we're walking right, if we're living right, if we're learning the truth and learning God's word, we don't have to be afraid of being deceived by Satan. 
Because the Bible promises me, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would lead us in all truth. And if we allow the Spirit to take God's Word and quicken it to our hearts, and we equip ourselves with the armor of God, which we'll be talking about in a couple weeks, I guess. If, if we equip ourselves with the armor of God, we, we will stand against the wiles of the devil. So I hope tonight we can get a little bit of equipment on how we can stand, how we don't have to be afraid of what's happening in the world. We don't have to be afraid of the 6.8 earthquake that might happen someday. We don't have to be afraid of the Islamic terrorists that would like to destroy our nation. We don't have to be afraid of, of the ones uh, that like to pull down everything that we hold dear because of God's word assures us that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. So in 2 Peter, if you read with me starting in chapter 1, this first chapter Peter tells us about righteousness. Righteousness. That's a big word. Righteousness. He tells us about the provision for righteousness, the path of righteousness, the power of the righteous God, and the promise of the righteous God. Everything we need to live as believers is included in this word. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 1, and we're just going to read tonight and just God. read God's word. Simon Peter, we all know who Peter was, right? He was the guy with the big mouth. Peter had a big mouth. And most of the time he stuck his foot in it. There was a few times that, you know, he got a star on his forehead. But, you know, he said some things that were right sometimes, but there was other times that Jesus had to straighten him out. But that was, that was way before this. It's interesting that the same Peter, and you know, this is just a common thing, the same Peter that denied Jesus three times just a few weeks later preached the message of 5,000 people got saved. See, the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. The Spirit of God makes all the difference. Peter says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Interesting how servant came before apostle. That's another message too. But we're not necessarily going to go there tonight. There's a whole lot of folks who call themselves apostles who don't want to be a servant. If you don't want to be a servant, don't think you're going to be an apostle. You know, if you don't want to be a servant, don't think you're going to be a pastor, preacher, teacher. You've got to start there, okay? Remember when Jesus washed their feet? And Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you ain't going to have no part of me. But Jesus said, Peter said, wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you let me, if I do this for you and I'm your master, shouldn't you do this to one another? Like, that's another message too. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, uh, just in the greeting, Peter says a whole lot. Okay. He goes on and he says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. We have been given in his divine power Everything we need to live a godly life. Everything we need to live a godly life. Been given to us. We don't have to go to another book for it. We don't have to go to a program for it. We don't have to go to a rehab for it. We don't have to go chasing after revivals and meetings and things all over the, all over the, 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 you know, the continent. It's all been given to us. It's, it's, it belongs to everybody who's a believer. If you've been saved for, for five days or 50 years, it's yours. You have everything you need to live a godly life right here in God's Word. There's nothing you have to add to it. And nothing you can take away from it. That's His power. He's given us all things. He's given us knowledge of Him through His Word. Verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Think about that. Partakers of the divine nature. We have the ability, and we have the promise, and we have everything we need to be like Jesus. Now, we can never be God. I can never be a creator God. I can never be, I, I, you know, the eternal God. I'm, I had a beginning. I had, I had a start somewhere. God had no beginning, and he has no ending. But we can partake of his divine nature. And how can we do it? Through knowing his word. 
his great and precious promises that are in his word. This is the provision that he's given us for righteousness in his word and through his Holy Spirit. We can live and we can be anchored and we can be rooted and grounded. Partakers of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So I, I feel that there's a lot of folks that are Christians and maybe have accepted Jesus Christ, but they don't, they don't believe or they have never heard that they can be free from the things that bound them before they were saved. I believe God can set you free. He can make you free. Jesus said, who the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. He can deliver you from the things. Some folks think that I'm just always going to be an alcoholic. I'm always going to be a cracker. I'm always going to be a heroin addict. I'm always going to be what, what I am. But through God's provision, His righteousness, He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. Now listen, it doesn't come easy. Some folks think they get saved and they just sit back and things are going to start happening. There's, there's, there's something on our part. We have to pursue righteousness. And that's what he goes and begins to talk to us here in, in uh, verse 5. He says, he's told us about the provision for righteousness. Now he wants to tell us about the path of righteousness. There's a path. It doesn't just happen. Now we're saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about living a sanctified life. A life set apart. A life that reflects Christ in us. This, this passage is one of the first messages I ever preached in, in, over Pastor Spencer's church. He says in verse 5, And beside this, Beside these things that God has given us, that he's equipped us with, he said, beside this, giving all diligence. That word diligence, that, that means an effort. You know, some folks don't like to make an effort for anything. You know, we just don't want to make an effort. Sometimes, if you want to get something done, not sometimes, all times, if you want to get something done, you've got to make an effort. Things don't happen by themselves. My grass is not going to cut itself. I have to go down, get the lawnmower, drag it out, and get the weed eater. I've got I to gotta make an effort. It's work. You know, you, 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 your house don't get clean by itself. It gets dirty all by itself. But it doesn't get clean by itself. My wife will tell you I don't do good in that area. That's not my forte. It's cleaning. I've never... I've never quite overcome that. I'm working on that one. But it takes an effort. Peter tells us to give diligence. You need to, you need to adopt the mindset that this life in Christ, salvation is, is a gift of God. Life in Christ, sanct the sanctified life, the holy life, requires effort. And it doesn't mean you're going to be more saved than somebody else. This is just something that he's told us, he wants us to do. He wants us to reflect who he is. So he says, giving all diligence add to your faith. We begin with faith. We begin with faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. That's where we start. We're saved by faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. But when you add to your faith virtue, that word virtue is it's like power. It's like manliness, you know, bravery, courage. God give us boldness. What did they pray for just a few days after the day of Pentecost when they were being persecuted? They prayed for boldness, virtue, courage. Add to your faith. For, don't be afraid to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to share your testimony. You know what I saw today? I was, I was looking on the internet and I, on, on my homepage, there's you know, Fox News, okay? And they had on there an article about David Berkowitz. You know who David Berkowitz is? They used to call him the son of Sam. How many of you are old enough to remember the son of Sam? For, for, for about two years, he was going out in New York City shooting people in cars with a 44 caliber. He was, he was demon-possessed. By his own admission, he was possessed of the devil. Well, he went to prison, and you know what? He got saved. He got saved. And they had an article in there. They said, David, he's not even interested in parole. He was given like 12 sentences of 25 years of life or something and he's up for parole he says he doesn't want parole 
doesn't want parole. He's in jail. He's saved. He shares his testimony. He works with the chaplain. I mean, it's really a great letter. Here's a guy who was possessed of the devil and got saved. And he's not, he didn't get saved just to get out of jail. I'm telling you what, there's a whole lot of guys get saved thinking, thinking it's going to get him out of jail. He doesn't want to get out of jail. He's been redeemed. Oh, so I, I should have brought the letter to read it to you. But he, here's a fellow that got saved and he wasn't afraid. When he was demon possessed, he wasn't afraid to go shoot people. When he got saved, he wasn't afraid to go tell people he was saved. And let God use him in that prison to minister to other, other guys there. You add to your faith, virtue. And to your virtue, you add knowledge. Learn this word. Learn about Jesus. Learn who God is. Learn who Christ is. Learn what he came to do. There's no mystery. It's all been revealed. It's everything that he did. It's everything that we can understand about God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So if you want to have knowledge, don't go buy all these other books. Go to this book. Matter of fact, I recommend people get one of these books, especially if you're just starting out, get one of these books that don't have no footnotes in it. Just get, just get one of these books and ask the Holy Spirit to say, make me understand this. He, and He will. And you'll have knowledge of who God is, of who Christ is, and what He came to do. And what He came to do for you. You have to your faith, virtue. <laughs> and to your virtue, knowledge. And to your knowledge, temperance or self-control. It doesn't say self-esteem. It says self-control. You learn how to control yourself in Christ. You learn how to control your desires. Your less yes, you can control. Yes, I can keep from going down to the refrigerator at 3 o'clock in the morning and eating a and eating a donut. I can, okay? I can resist the stuff I used to do before I got saved. I can resist the things that used to have me bound. I have, the, 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 one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. You don't get self-control by just sitting back and yawning. I remember one time Brother Patrick preached a message about going down the river in a boat, drifting down the river. I'll never forget that message. <laughs> just drifting down the river. Man, we think we're just going to drift down the river and everything's going to be all right. You drift down the Niagara River, you're going to end up going over Niagara Falls. Okay? Give diligence, self-control, and that temperance, patience, waiting, a, 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 an expectant waiting on God. What patience isn't just putting up with something. But patience is waiting, hoping, knowing that God is going to come through. Patience, waiting for God to deliver on what he said he was going to do. And to patience, godliness. Holy living. See, this is, you, you see the progression here. Growing in grace. Growing in your Christian walk. Becoming more and more like Jesus. These are all descriptions of who Jesus was. Being more pious, being more holy, being more respectful of the things of God. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. The word in the Greek is the word Philadelphia. It's brotherly kindness. The love that we have one for another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. The common, the common friendship, the, the koinonia, the fellowship that we can accomplish one another. The care for one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And finally, the pinnacle of this progression is charity or agape. Agape love. I'm going to tell you something. Agape love doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Agape love isn't a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not romance. Agape love is a decision and very often it becomes a painful decision. Love hurts. Agape love sometimes hurts. Sometimes your heart will break. What did Jesus, the agape love that held him on the cross, what did he feel when he was hanging there? That's the, that's the extreme. That's, man, if you've got to that level, you're walking in the shoes of Jesus Christ. And that's what we strive for as believers. Are we ever going to get there before we go to be with him? Probably not. We strive for it. Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians, he says, I push toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. He says, I haven't attained yet. He was writing the New Testament and said he hadn't got there yet. 
But he said, I look behind me, and I see where I come from, and I, I'm not there anymore, and I look ahead and see where I'm going and know that I'm going to get there through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the Christian walk. That's growing in grace. Peter tells us, we have these promises, now we have this path that we have to walk. It's a narrow path. It's not a wide path. It's a, it's a path that you, ultimately, we, we enjoy each other's company and we pray for one another, but ultimately, you have to walk this path alone. Nobody can do this for you. You can be taught, you can see examples, you can, people can mentor you, but ultimately, you have to make this decision for yourself. That you're going to make an effort to be the person that Christ wants you to be. See, if you do that, you see, the stuff that we've been watching over the last five weeks, we, we, we've been looking at people trying to present different ways to get there. There. Everybody's trying to get somewhere. Everybody's trying to get to the other side. Everybody's looking for a nirvana somewhere. And we're always looking inside. People are looking inside, you know, looking for that God inside of you. You're not going to find God inside of you unless you're born again and have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And that Spirit that's living inside of you, He's going to take you down this path if you'll let Him. He will draw you. He'll teach you. He'll show you all righteousness. But we have to let Him. And we have to be willing to make the effort. God help us make an effort. We, go, you know, we live in a society we want everything to be push button. We don't go and make an effort. We got robots that clean the, you know, sort of vacuum the floor. We want, we want to try to find, you know. Man, we, you ever see them things on TV, you know, lose 30 pounds in 30 days? Yeah. I get a kick out of the ones. I like to go down the Y, you know. I like to go down the Y. I go down the weight room down the Y, and I just, I don't do a lot of really heavy, you know. But I just kind of just go down there and work out. But I know a lot of guys down there that are like real, you know. And you look at these commercials on the TV and they say, get these flat abs in the 30 days, you know, wear this belt or <laughs> watch this video. It takes an effort. It takes an effort. Okay. Peter goes on. You know how they talk about having a six pack, you know? I tell people I don't have a six pack, I have a keg. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Now look at verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, if, you've, if you're growing in grace, if you're living the life that Christ wants you to live, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we make this effort to live this, Christ, this life at Christ, this Christ-like life, we don't have to be afraid of what's going on out there. We don't have to be afraid of what's happening in the Middle East. We don't have to be afraid of what's happening on Wall Street. We don't have to be afraid of earthquakes. We don't have to be afraid of any of that because these things are working in us. If we're living a life that Christ tells us to live. Look at verse 9. But he that lacks these things. Now here's the warning. If we don't make the effort. I'm not talking about salvation is, is, is a gift given by God. I'm talking about this walk. This life that we're living. If we don't make the effort. We're blind. And we can't see afar off. And we have forgotten that he was purged uh, from his old sins. See, if we don't make the effort, we'll be, we'll be a sucker for anything that comes down the pipe. And that's why I think there's so many people that are buying into a lot of this stuff that we've seen before, because they've never made the effort to learn the truth. Even once who are really saved, maybe some of them are just, have gone through the motions, but they've never made an effort to understand and to learn and to realize that yes, there is a life that we can live worthy of being called a believer of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence. There's that word again. Be diligent. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Right? People get in an argument about losing your salvation. Listen, if you've got more of Jesus, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. It's not an argument. It's not a, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a debate. It's a moot point. Brother Lovey Scott says, once saved, always saved. He says, you need more Jesus. 
If you got more Jesus, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. You don't have to worry about nobody can take it from you. He says, to give diligence, that means to make the effort, to work at it, to, to work. Listen, you've got to work at living the Christian life. Not to be saved, but to show the world what salvation is all about. God didn't save you to be this, the same old person you were before you got saved. He saved you to make you a new creature. He says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I shall not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Peter used this term about putting in remembrance like three times in this first section. He wanted to remind them. He wanted to say, you remember what I taught you? Don't forget. You know, if you don't do something a lot, you forget how to do it. This is a daily practice. This isn't just something you do like three times a year. <laughs> he begins to talk about the power of the righteous God. He says in verse 13, Yes, and I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Peter knew that his end was near. When he talks about putting off his tabernacle, the tabernacle he was talking about was his body. This is our tabernacle. It's the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to be martyred. Peter knew Jesus gave him, uh, back in John chapter uh, 21, the last chapter of John, uh, Jesus gave him an indication of how he would die. Some people traditionally, some people say that Peter was crucified upside down. We don't know that for a fact. But we do know that he was, we believe that he was martyred. And he knew that he was getting ready to be martyred. So he said, while I'm here, while I'm still living, I want to remind you, I want you to understand this, because after I'm here, I'm not going to be able to run, remind you anymore. He says, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So thank God Peter wrote this stuff down that we could read it 2,000 years later. And he says this. Now this is the power of the righteous God. He talked about the provision for righteousness, the path of righteousness. Now he's going to talk about the power of God. You know, in the Old Testament, when you look at the uh, book of Exodus, when, when they were coming through the wilderness, God appeared to them as a... Uh, a uh, cloud by day and a fire by night. The Shekinah glory of God. He met them when they, that tabernacle, that's where he would, that's where he would meet them. The, the glory would cover that tabernacle. And those people always had a visible representation of God. His glory. When we talk about glory, glory we talk about fire and light and smoke and noise and, and you know, on Mount Sinai, the glory of God. Peter says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We didn't make this stuff up. This isn't, this isn't a fairy tale. It's not, it's, not a, it's not folklore. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, Peter said, I saw the glory of God. I myself laid my eyes. I saw the glory of God. For he received from God, in verse 17, the Father, honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. If you want to read about that, you can go back to Matthew chapter 17. When they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they were sitting there and they were kind of falling asleep. And all of a sudden Jesus went there and the glory of God appeared. And Moses and Elijah appeared talking to Jesus about his death. About, it's, it's interesting how glory is associated with death. Peter says, we didn't make that up. We didn't read that in a book. That's not a fairy tale, but I saw with my own eyes the glory of God descending upon our Lord. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. We saw and heard the glory of God. That was one of those times that Peter put his foot in his mouth. If you remember the story, Peter was there, and there was, there was Elijah, and there was Moses, and there was Jesus. 
and the glory of God that was like so bright that they couldn't even, they could barely look on it. And Peter said, hey, let's build us a church here. <laughs> man, man, this is like a holy place, you know. And that's when God said, listen to him. <laughs> Peter, take your foot out your mouth. And listen to what Jesus says. Peter was ready to make the kingdom right then and there. Because the glory of God was there. He didn't realize that there had to be death. Had to be death. Jesus didn't gl get glory until he died. That's when he was glorified. If I be lifted up, I'll draw a man unto me. That's the power of the righteous God, the Shekinah glory that fell. And you would think, if, you know, if I saw something like that, if we actually laid our eyes on the very glory of God, what would that do to us? You say, wow. But you know what, just a few months after they saw that glory, a few months after Peter laid his eyes on that glory of God, you know what he did? He said, I don't know him. Some little girl came up to him and said, hey, you're one of his followers. He says, I don't know who he is. Seeing the Shekinah didn't do it for Peter. But now he tells us about the promise of the righteous one. And he says this in verse 19. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He said, we told you what we saw in the Mount of Transfiguration. We told you about the glory that fell down and we were, man, heard the voice of, of, of the very God of creation. Heard his voice. But we got something better. We got something better. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto you do well that you take heed is unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What's this word of prophecy, Peter? What's this word of prophecy that we have to grab a hold of that's so important, that's even better than seeing the very Shekinah glory of God? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture, and this word prophecy isn't just talking about the prophets foretelling things. It's talking about the word of God. The God's spoken word of this. He says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. This isn't man's idea. This isn't somebody's uh, assessment of what went on. This isn't man's history, this word. There's lots of books about that. There's probably millions and millions of books that men have written but this word comes from the very heart of God. It's more important to know this word than to see the very glory of God. This word has more power to change lives. He says, knowing this verse, in verse 20, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's God's word. Now he gives us this foundation. And starting in chapter 2, he begins talking about the false prophets and the false teachers. The things that we've been watching over the last five Wednesdays. Before he starts talking about that, he lays the foundation of the provision of a righteous God for everything we need. He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. Of the path of righteousness, being diligent, pressing our way through, doing everything we can to learn and to grow virtue and knowledge and godliness and, and uh, 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 brotherly love and agape love all these things to, to make the effort to try to, to allow the Holy Spirit to make us everything that we need to be make us like Jesus he told us about God's power but he, now he's telling us about his word when we watch those videos a, current, a, current, a, a common thread through all those videos was that they were looking at the Bible and they were saying, well, you can't really... Just what Satan said in the garden. 
You can't really depend on it. Well, we have to make this fit today. It's old. And this is, this is 2001. It's, it's two millennia later. And, and, and you know, it's just, not, it's just not enough. It's not right for today. We've got we to tweak it a little bit. We have to reinvent Christianity. It's not good enough. We have to reinvent the word. We have to reinterpret. It doesn't fit our society. It doesn't fit our culture. And that's where the false teaching, and that's where the lies, and that's where the apostasy comes from. Questioning. Well, they didn't really say that. Well, I Isaiah really didn't write the whole thing. There's really maybe two or three people that wrote Isaiah. Daniel didn't really, Daniel didn't really live at the time of Babylon. It was really in between the Testaments. And uh, they, uh, he wrote that just to make the people feel good. John in Revelation, that, that, didn't have, that doesn't have anything to do with the end times. That's just, he, was just, he was just trying to encourage his people to be strong. They call God a liar. But Peter says that this word didn't come from the will of man. People didn't think this stuff up. You couldn't think it up. If man had wrote this book, it would have a different ending. It would have a different story if man wrote this book. It would have a whole different pers perspective. This prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy, holy men of God. See, I got a problem with folks the one to tell me godly things and they ain't living holy. Now, all, all kinds of people want to stand up and preach and call themselves apostles and preachers and teachers, but they're not living holy. They're not making, they're not given diligence to live this life that we read about, to, to, to take that path of righteousness. They don't care about that. They just want to shoot their mouths off. He talks about that in the next chapter. It came from holy men of God. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, nobody writes scripture today. Scripture's finished. It's done. But when somebody stands up behind the pulpit, they better be, they better be filled with the Holy Ghost. When I or Mr. Casey or Pastor Todd or somebody comes up here and preaches or I have somebody here. They, they better, I, I pray God, anoint them with the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're not anointed with the Holy Spirit, you can speak words, you can talk words, and people will go in one, one or not the other and people will leave the same way they came in. But if the Holy Spirit's at work, he'll take, you don't even have to be a good speaker. He'll take these words, just like he took the words in this book and it gives them power. If somebody speaks or preaches this word, the Holy Spirit will take that and empower it to touch somebody's life and change somebody's life and get them on this path of righteousness. See, when we start next week, if, if the Lord wills, and we go into chapter 2 and we start reading about all these, all these false teachers and preachers that we've been hearing about here and, and, and learning about here, if we have this foundation correct, We'll be able to tell them a mile away. Come on, you know, if you've got the Holy Spirit, there's sometimes you've heard people speak and you didn't know exactly what was wrong, but you knew something was wrong. And you found out later. I always tell people, if you get a check in your spirit about somebody, don't ignore it. Just listen. You know, God will show you. He'll show you every time. But we need the foundation. We need the foundation. God's Word, His power. We need to be diligent to be trying to live the life that God wants us to live. I wish it were easy. I'd like to say, you know, if it were easy, you wouldn't have to be diligent. <laughs> if it were easy, you wouldn't have to make an effort. There's some things you just got to make an effort. Paul said in another letter, and I'm closing, I don't want to ramble on. He said, you know, body, bodily exercise profits little. But we learn to exercise our faith. God gives us the opportunity to exercise our faith. 
when things don't go the way we want them to? Like I say, I, I see these guys down the line, you know, with the weights. If you never try to lift 224, 225 pounds, you'll never lift 225 pounds. If you never try to bench press, you know, you'll never get there. If you, if you stick with 100 pounds, that's all you'll do. You've got to put more weight on. And you've got to have somebody there to help you. You've got to have a spotter. Because you might get it up there and get it back down and can't get back. <laughs> can't get it. So you've got to have somebody there to help you. But once they help you one time, the next time you do it, you know what? You'll be able to... Then you put a little bit more weight on. That's the way God does. He'll, you know, he'll, give, he'll give you a test of faith. And he'll bring you through it. He'll spot for you. He'll get you through. You'll say, hey. Then another one's coming. And it'll be a little heavier. But see, that's how we get where we need to be. If you never make an effort to love somebody, you'll never love anybody. If you ne never make an effort to share your faith, you'll never share your faith. If you never make an effort to be diligent, to be virtuous, you'll never be there. You just sit back, kick your feet up, and float down a river. But God help us be the people we need, of God we need to be. Amen? Amen. All right.